we do welcome Sean just to talk about your uh, experience with um, your activities and introduce yourself. Sean, I know we have a very small group here this afternoon, so I guess the good weather had something to do with that, but we are recording this, so this will be uh, become um, maybe not your best TED talk, but your second. And uh, yeah. welcome anyway. Let's let's hear it from Sean. Great. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. You know, we've been um, passionate about the conscious capitalism movement for a number of years now um, and uh, have adopted a lot of a lot of what it stands for directly into our business practices, you know, like I think most conscious capitalists when they, when they discover the movement or the uh, philosophy, you know, they, uh, they, the, the typical comment I think is, Oh, that's, isn't that just the way you do things or isn't that the way it should be done? So I, I don't think for most people that are wired this way, you know, it's, it's a unique way of thinking or doing business. But sadly, as, as you know, it, um, there are plenty of examples of businesses that, or leaders or executives that uh, do not operate in that fashion and, and has given capitalism a bad name. So happy to be associated with it, happy to support it. So what um, I, I followed your success stories from um, being bag in garage to um, you know, national uh, brand. Help us understand the transition from where you were at LoveSac uh, into the design for life mentality and, and all that. Because when I first arrived to the US, I came here in, in, in the 80s and I was, you know, obviously attracted at the time I was working in retail marketing. So I, I found the consumer culture in this country very attractive because it, it was constantly, you know, um, reinventing itself um, and, and the consumer market really is a huge driver of the GDP. Uh, and some of the things that you're, you're identifying in Design for Life uh, run a little bit against that sort of counterculture. So um, yeah. let's, let's explore that a bit. Yeah, no, in fact, uh, thanks for that observation. Look, we began just making giant bean bags because I had made one in college and people loved it and wanted more of them. Along the way, we opened our own stores and then we, you know, we had a couch in the corner to kind of, you know, put our love sacks in a living room setting. People kept trying to buy the couch. So we invented our own take on the couch, which turned out to be really unique. It essentially, I'm sitting on it right now. It's essentially a couch you could have the rest of your life. You, you buy a bunch of seats, you buy a bunch of sides, you can rearrange them forever, wash them in your washing machine, change the covers, add to them, grow them as your life. You know, I have pieces in my living room 12 years old and, and 12 months old uh, that are mixed. You'd have no idea which are which. And, and, the, and we continue to come out with new accoutrements for this platform that are reverse compatible. So very, you know, very much in the face of Apple and, and technology companies that are constantly making their products um, no longer viable. We, we have the opposite mentality and, and that's evolved to a, what we call, um, it's actually not what we state as our purpose. Our, uh, it's what we state as our Big hairy audacious goal, to quote Jim Collins, um, which is to uh, convince mankind or inspire mankind to buy less stuff, but buy better stuff. And, and we find that people that once they start interfacing with sectionals, so the name of our platform, for sectional sofas that can be with you for the rest of your life, they really do start thinking differently about the other stuff they buy because all of a sudden it opens their mind like, holy cow, why, why? Why, why must my phone die every year or so? Why, why couldn't my clothing be built to adapt with me or to, you know, whatever the case may be. And so that gave rise over the past few years as we became more sophisticated as an organization, more introspective. So we kind of came up backwards. We didn't start with some great philosophy or purpose and then go after it. We invented a product that had these attributes and it gave rise to this design for life philosophy, which essentially means products that are built to last a lifetime, but designed to evolve with you. So you might actually choose to own them for a lifetime. And, and of course, our big, hairy, audacious goal, inspiring people to buy less stuff, which is a weird thing to say for a company that sells stuff. Yeah, and I guess we're reminded of that every time I live in Norfolk, Connecticut, and you know, every twice a year, there's this massive pile of consumables that just builds up on the, on the sidewalk in the city comes by and cleans it up and it just seems to be part of this constant um, yeah. churn 
of the consumer market, which of course consumes uh, vastly too many uh, natural resources and not to mention um, the, the, the size of these landfills are just getting bigger and bigger. So I think it's a, I think it's a very positive move in the consumer market to, to buy less stuff and, buy, and, and, um, and just buy much more consciously. Um, yeah. I, myself, I, I've, I've been a victim of that, um, you know, just thinking about, well, what's my history of couch, of couch cons, um, purchases? And I've, I've bought probably one too many as well. So it's, it's actually a very good uh, product to demonstrate what longevity can look like. Yeah, um, particularly the way you reskin them and so on. So um, <clears throat> I'm here to open it up to the group. Gavin, our chairman, just joined us, um, and and so welcome, Gavin, to dive in at any time. I know you've got a lot of um, strong thoughts around around the this idea of consumerism, um, and anyone else on the call. So um, let's just open open mic for Sean at this point. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I I love the whole idea, and, and sorry I'm, I'm, I was late, um, but yeah, I sort of felt for a while like whenever I buy a thing, I'm taking responsibility for it. So it's like, so if I, you know, buy a thing, it's like okay, so at the end of its life or whatever, I have to make sure the right thing happens to it, you know, and it and it goes the right way and all that kind of stuff. So it, it kind of makes makes you pause a little bit and go like, oh yeah, well, do I really need this? Or is that really the one I would get? And, you know, and, and, you know, I've always it sort of loved to, when I buy tools, buy tools that are really, really good so that, you know, you buy it once, you know, never have to buy it again, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, a lot of people just like want to jump in and buy the latest thing that, you know, some color or new fangled something or other. And yeah, that kind of deal. So it's, well, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, so we've come up with it as we've sort of fleshed out the philosophy and, and there's a whole blog that we keep that kind of open source at DF, dflgroup.org where we publish, you know, our thinking and our research and eventually, you know, we'll, we'll write the book because I think it deserves a book. You know, we've, we've kind of come up with these antitheses that we've observed in, in the world. Like, and one of the biggest one we talk about, of course, is planned obsolescence and how, you know, we're all just victims of this cycle and it's, it's prevalent in like everything, you know, yeah. everything, the cadence of our lives is dictated by what actually began as just a kind of an innocent approach to lifting us out of depression back in the thirties. Like, Hey, GE, could you make, the, you know, there's the government calling. Could you please make those fridges break, you know, within 10 years. So people got to buy more. And, you know, it was turned out to be a celebrated economic endeavor. And then, you know, look where it's brought us. Fashion is a design. I mean, it, you know, it just pervades our lives. And, and actually, sadly, the choices that we have, to your point, are actually quite limited in many, in many categories of, of what we could even get that might live up to anything remotely close to, you know, the philosophy that we in, engender. Yeah. Um, and so we hope, like, what, you know, whenever I speak on this topic, we always say, I always say, you know, copy us, knock us off. Like we hope yeah. that people will take our philosophy and apply it to other categories. Right. And of course the consumers will behave like you and start taking responsibility and thinking about what they do. And, yeah. and, and if we can do that to your point through the lens of a couch, which sounds yeah. kind of banal, but that's yeah. the beauty of it, right? Every house has one, everyone. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've been in like the, the backwoods of China Africa, and believe it or not, most homes, even in the most remote places, have, a, have some kind of a couch. Yeah. And so it can be a product that kind of reaches many people. And it's kind of an unlikely Trojan horse to kind of inject our philosophy. Most people just buy it because like, it's a kid proof couch, you got me. But then they start to come around, you know, we make all this upholstery. These aren't wearing covers at the moment, I just set them up. This is made of 100% recycled plastic water bottles, all of it. We've we become in one year, the single largest repurposer of plastic water bottles in the United States to home deck fabric. And that's this dinky little less than 1% market share of the couch business company. I mean, that's a lot of plastic. And so, you know, it starts, you don't have to be an environmentalist to embrace this way of thinking. Yep, yep. One of the, one of the things I, about uh, smart cars a long time ago is that you could take the body panels off 
you know, mm -hmm. put different panels on, you know, different colors or whatever, yeah. depending on your mood, that kind of thing. That's and it. I started to think, you know, what if you could like buy a car when you're in your 20s and then, you know, and maybe you wanted a sports coupe kind of thing, right? And then wouldn't it be nice if you could like take the body part off, keep the engine and the suspension system, everything, take yeah. the other part off, drop on, you know, a mobile, you know, carriage or something on this thing instead, you know, something a little bigger because then you got to keep the kids. And then, you know, and then, you know, if I want to upgrade the stereo system, whatever, just, you know, grab this one, pull it out, stick the other one in, sell this one on eBay, you know, to somebody else and, you know, just have everything so that everything is the same bolt pattern, same system, same, whatever. So you can just snap it on. And, you know, nowadays with like electric cars and stuff, it should be even easier to do that. You know, and at That's some point, different. maybe I want to upgrade something or whatever. And like, yeah, so then I do that and swap it out and, you know, sell the other part to somebody else, or if it's if it's done, if it's reached its life expectancy, then it gets recycled or something. But. Yeah, with Tesla, with Tesla's you know overnight upgrades, he's they're so on the way, and you know my view is if he if he for instance adopted our philosophy, and or if I were running that company, that's exactly the outcome. Yeah, that's exactly right. And by the way, it doesn't it sounds a little crazy, like hey, it's a transformer now, it's going to be a coupe today and a truck tomorrow. Right. But you know what? I'm not a car guy. So I did it with, and it sounds crazy, but we did it with a couch. So yeah. couldn't smarter people than me do it in these other categories. And by the way, compete. You know, you want to know how to take down Apple. You develop a phone. That's why I carry this one. I love this one, by the way. So it's, how old is it? I, it's my favorite one. And I've kept it alive, even though they're trying to kill it, right? Actively. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you put in, in front of any consumer one that, could have a great camera and as that camera gets better and better, you could yep. just you know, modularly pop, pop it out. out. By the way, change the battery and all these things. Yep. Yep. You and I know that we would all be uh, fans as long as the platform didn't suck. Right. And right. probably pay more for it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because over the long term, you know, you're, you're by not having to replace all that stuff all the time and then you'd get better quality parts. You know, yeah. so instead of steel, it would be aluminum or stainless steel or something like that. Because, you you know, basically you'd have it for the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, potentially. And just That's exactly what we're trying to, like, get across in our little old couch furniture way. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Well, have, have you had any luck with any other categories? Like you said, furniture has been your, your <laughs> sort of zero. But um, with this design for life, strategy has there been any kind of um success stories in in other industries like for me the antithesis of this is the fashion business right who, who constantly um need a, a tweak of the collar or this and that um and clearly i'm a, a victim of that as well um but you know uh, the, 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 it's just such a massive suck of resources that uh it, it's unsustainable in any any way so i'm wondering yeah. if if in your if, if you've got a, a sort of vision of other categories that would work as well yeah I, I do i i think that the answer there is most i think most product categories work under this philosophy mm. i think that i've only got one lifetime on this earth and frankly if you know if i'm allowed i will be doing this uh, for the next few decades, you know, it took me two decades to sort of get it together at the scale that matters at all. Mm. And I've learned a lot. And now we're running faster and moving faster. And we will enter other tangential categories. But man, you know, what's crazy is look at look at the biggest product company in the world sells like three things. And so that's a lifetime endeavor to almost tackle anything successfully yeah. forget about trying to do it in a design for life way just to have commercial success at scale is hard and that's why we we target two uh, audiences at design for life we you know as we publish this work and eventually try and make it our own movement sort of maybe similar to conscious capitalism and of course building on conscious in fact we we name conscious capitalism as one of our you know four uh, key texts that we build on um we would hope to inspire uh, consumers to behave that way. And we would hope to inspire entrepreneurs, business leaders, executives, designers mm. to design this way. 
and approach products this way, not, not out of like, you know, goodness out of their own heart or, or because they're a bleeding environmentalist, because it's, because it's making us tons of money. Because once you present these products to humans, they're like, that's awesome. A kid-proof, life-proof, washable couch. Oh, and by the way, it's made of water bottles. That's cool too, right? And so whether you come at it from an environmentalist standpoint or whether you come at it just from a practical standpoint, people are willing to pay more. This couch is very expensive. It costs the same as anything from restoration hardware, pottery barn, in some cases more. But you're literally going to have them the rest of your life if you choose to. And, and so we, that's where, you know, we need other business people. So my goal, my number one goal is actually just to have so much crushing success. Like I want like half the couch category. So we'll continue to expand these platforms because if you don't love this style, there will be others as an example. And it's, that's the crazy part. it will take me the better part of a decade just to own couches. But if I can do that, then how can other entrepreneurs not follow our pattern because we will have dominated a massive category created huge you know wealth for our investors and supporters and 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 great value for like how can you not copy that and that's what we want we want people to copy us in other categories because i don't have enough life to do it so we will attack other tangential categories but there's a lot left and by the way the reason you'll only ever see me wearing a black t-shirt is in protest you know in mild protest to the fashion industry i literally own a stack of black t-shirts Many of them I purchased in 2009. They don't fade if you wash them right. They last forever. They don't stain very easily. And they go, you know, and I can throw anything on top of it, which by the way, those, most of the jackets I buy, I will own the rest of my life because I'm thoughtful about which ones I even buy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like this little denim job that I might throw over it and I could probably own that the rest of my life and it's probably not really going to go out of style. And if it does, I don't care. And I, I'm, you know, you got to, and, and that's the kind of like mentality. That's where we want to change consumers thinking, you know, in everything. Yep. <clears throat> so having survived so many years in the retail industry, one of the, one of the mantras that we always talked about is that women are responsible for 70% of the purchasing decisions in most households. Um, so I'd be interested to tap into some of our women on the call to see if, yep. if, if um, you know, how does this idea sit with with you if you're considered to be the influential ones in in uh, what, what's purchased around the household? So, so I, as a woman, will definitely comment. Um, not because um, on the fashion side, but my question would be for Sean. You know, aren't you interested in developing? and I'm going to use the word technology, materials, fabrication techniques, methodologies to um, create a better couch, a less expensive couch, a more durable couch, um, improve the product that you have so that there's an upgrade to that. Or do you feel like when you came out of the shoot with Love Sack, you know, version 1.0, it was the best. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's, where on the consumerism side, forget about all the clothing and that whole piece of it. It's that- How do you make sense of that? Yeah, cars and technology and everything we're doing evolves and gets better. And I can buy a better couch three yeah. years from now than I bought you know, last year. Yeah, I have a lot of comments on that. And, and it's, it's, it's smack down the middle of the Design for Life ethos. So the Design for Life ethos is, I summarize it, like I said, built for last lifetime, designed to evolve. but it's an eight point framework that we think is pretty complete and we're very passionate about developing it out and really doing a lot of research. And, and frankly, what Love Sack is, is it's a case study. It's a case study to, to prove that the ethos works and not just works like, Oh, I can make a couch that could last a long time. Works like I can make a couch that's so desirable. We become the most successful furniture company on the planet. And if that's true, how do you argue with it? Right. And so to that end, one of those eight points is around what we call sustain hyphen ability. So there's sustainability, which is water bottles and better techniques and methods and production. And, and I've got a lot to say about that where, you know, currently we manufacture these full disclosure overseas. We're chopping down trees wherever to rail them to Vietnam, to, you know, to uh, 
slow boat them on diesel fuel across the globe's largest ocean, to land them in Long Beach, to rail them to Chicago, to FedEx them back to you. I mean, that's ridiculous. And that's how this world works right now. And it's stupid. And I'm part of it. And so our hope, and we, are, we have a whole team and dedicated to this, and we've been, we're on our third year of research, and, and it will turn into real work, but um, is to utilize possibly, you know, recycled plastics, possibly other things that are more, that are far more sustainable and good for the world and create, and this is, this is the key, create. So first of all, these, these sectionals that I'm sitting on right this second, again, they're not wearing covers, they're naked, I got to finish the job. They're brand new out of the box. And look, there's some pieces stacked up right over there, okay? And um, that's the beauty of it. You can have a bunch of pieces stacked in your basement, use them, deploy them, rearrange them, move to another place, whatever. But the neat thing is in my living room, I have pieces that are 12 years old mixed with pieces that are you know, a year old. And you, once the, you throw covers on them, you could not know which is which because that's the key, is developing a platform where you're able to keep, for instance, the outside dimensions, you're able to keep certain attributes, they're all interchangeable. So that even as we, and by the way, this is version 48. So to your point, I'm not making that up. Literally, we are on version 48 of sectionals. The internal construction, the wood we use, the techniques we use, we know where every screw is. It's the only product we make. So it's so good. It's so well built, way better built than some of my 12 year old ones, by the way, that are still kicking. And I've replaced some of the cushions and back pillows. They've gotten floppy over the years and some of the parts that are, that are not as durable. And we're working on that too. But my point is, is like, you gotta, you gotta, so you gotta come out of the shoot with a product that's at least good enough that it has longevity. And that's the lovability tenant. So we have all these tenants, these eight point tenants. The sustain hyphen ability one is about the idea of just making something that sustains. And so here's another good example of how you grow. So last year we, so in sectionals, the way that they connect, there's this hole in the side. <laughs> so seats and sides, sides can be arms or backs. And if you look very carefully, there's a hole down there with a teal clamp in it, okay? And that clamp, that hole, this square hole, can you guys see that? Yep. Okay, yep. so that's been there since 2007, the same dimension. And, and yeah, we've changed the internal construction, all these things. The clamps are down teal, they used to be black, you know, little things big things. But last year we launched what's called a power hub and the power hub is a device that sits inside there. It snaps in place. The cord drops down through this other hole. Here's a bunch of sides laying on their side. See that hole that looks like a size of a videotape. That hole is where the shoe packs so that the shoe takes no extra um, shipping to get to you. The shoe is kind of what holds sectionals together like Legos. I won't explain it too deeply on this call, but the point is it's very efficient. That hole allows the cord for the power hub to drop down and then sneak to the power outlet that your couch is probably blocking right now in your home anyway, okay? Now your couch has power, USB, USB-C, future-proof, and the whole thing's modular. It can be removed. But that power, what can I now do now that I've placed power in the place where your phone's dying all the time anyway? I can hide a charger in the crack of the cushion. I can get even sexier than that and probably make the couch charge your phone, you know, wirelessly. I could do all kinds of things that are coming. And the thing is, it was written into the script a decade ago. So you have to have a fair amount of foresight to put holes in your product. And by the way, we've done things recently where we have, we have put elements in the product that we don't even know what they're for yet. We have put passages through that have no purpose, but we know that some purpose will emerge as technology evolves around us and that will allow us to allow those core pieces that you bought in 2020 to still be valid in 2030 when we're on to the next technology in your living room, movie viewing, whatever experience that needs, that would be ideally situated around you, on you, under you, et cetera, right? And, and so we hope that that kind of thinking, so what's cool is when you enter the design process and we got lucky with these holes to some degree on the first pass, but now when we enter new products, we have this design framework, these eight point framework, and, and it's very high bar to live up to. Built to last lifetime, designed to evolve, lovable, sustainable, you know, I could list all these tenants. And man, it, that's why a product launch for us takes years. We've been working, like the product will launch in January, February this coming that we're really excited about. Will be our first major product launch in many years. We've done minor ones, wedges, roll arms, ways to modulate your sectionals along the way, the, the power hub but we've got a big one coming up next year. 
And what's cool is we've been cooking that for almost four years. And it's not cool. It's, it's hard because it's such a high bar. But when we launch it, man, we intend to, everything we launch, we intend to sell for like the next decade or two or three. You know, so it changes the way you approach things as opposed to just spitting out generation after generation of pro. I mean, look at the vacuum cleaner. Every, every six months, it's like another thing, you know, it's another, tr- and everything's garbage. And, and, and it's like crazy town. Yep. Anyway, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question yeah. or not, but that's how I think yeah. about it. No, I got, I got my grandmother's Electrolux still works, but you know, a pile of other vacuum cleaners came and went, you know, in the meantime, you know. So, you don't make them like that anymore. No, exactly. That's a I metal housing. I had to and replace think- the switch once, found one on eBay and switched it out. And that was good. Cool. I think also that you're in a product category that allows um, this design, you know, live forever, evolve forever to work. Um, vacuum cleaners, telephones, anything that's technology based, I think is going to be more difficult. But a couch, a lot of people will invest and they'll spend the money that you've suggested that it's going to cost, you know, a $10,000 couch. They're going to, you know, spend the money for a $10,000 couch, $10,000 couch, intending, yeah, I'm keeping this puppy for 20 years. And the fact that you've built in what you've built in to allow it to evolve right. as it needs to, um, I think answers that question, but I think there's, I just feel again, there's so many cat, maybe it's a woman thing, so many categories out there that that can't work because. So here's my problem. It's funny. Can I, can I say something? Cause, yeah, cause, yeah. cause you know, I'm a woman and, and I really think it's, it's just like your approach. I, it made, it makes me think of a couple of stories. I had a coat. I love the coat. It was a, a black and white checkered wool coat. And yeah, it was at least 10 years old before I did it. And my nieces used to work with me in, in a business I had. And they used to say to me, auntie, when will you throw that coat away? Please throw that coat away. I'm like, there is nothing wrong with this coat. The lining doesn't have a tear. There's not a button. There's not a, why should I throw this coat away? And in fact, I think I gave it to someone I finally did. And it, it, it just... I compare that to, I was out of New York and I came back, I needed like some clothes and my friend said, oh, you can just go get some disposable clothes. And I thought, disposable clothes? I'm I'm like, what the hell are disposable? I thought some new thing was created. And he said, you know, this store H&M because they sell really cheap clothes. And as you were talking about this couch, I thought of those things and the fact that my last cell phone, which I had for four years, there's no reason why these cell phones need to be replaced every year. Like, this is one of the reasons, you, no offense, you guys might love Apple. Like, my son, I hate it. I refuse to buy it because I feel that they're mainly responsible for this. It's just by design. There's no reason at all for that to be developed that way. So I feel like in, in all the different Section maybe not as long as a couch, but I think in everything, cars, TVs, certainly cars, some more than others. And I would still have that four-year-old phone had I not dropped it. Well, Even like, though it's still another, working quirky. Well, another, <laughs> I, I think I, another I, good I, example is, is refrigerators. We, you know, we recently, my wife and I recently replaced the refrigerator that died, and it, it killed me, but the guy was like, I can't get the thing out. It's not accessible. I can't do anything with it. I'm like, so we've got this perfectly nice stainless steel box with all this insulation in it and all this other stuff. And there's this part that you can't get out of it. It's so so we're going to throw away the entire refrigerator. Yeah. You know, it just, this, this makes no sense, you know? And then, you know, so, so what would be lovely is a refrigerator that's super insulated, really well done, you know, when, you know, maybe, you know, maybe there's, you know, incandescent or fluorescent, fluorescent bulbs in it initially, but you could swap them out for LED bulbs someday. Um, there's, you know, and then, and then if there's a better, more efficient compressor that comes out, that's 30% more efficient, I want to save energy, then I buy that other compressor, yeah. you know, pull the thing away from the wall, slot the thing out, unplug it, you know, put the Two new one the- in, plug it back in and, and off I go. No, I mean, you touched on at least two of the, uh, what we call, of the eight tenants. One is upgradable. So again, when you you put a product, any product, through this eight-point framework, you know, and you say, okay, well, how is this upgradable? 
Mm. Okay, that's the challenge. And you just take yeah. it one step at a time. Okay, how is it maintainable? That's another one, yeah. right? And you got to make it maintainable. So our, like, there's got to be a way to maintain it or, or whatever. Swap out parts, modularities woven yeah. into that, all those things. Sustain hyphenable and sustainable. That's, uh, there's four tenets. Lovable, it's got to be designed in a way like your black and white coat that is uh, tasteful, but not trendy. If it's trendy, it's going to, by definition, be out of yeah. style, right? And so sectionals, some people's complaint is that it's very plain. It's like very boxy, simple. That's the point. Now, there could be shapeshifter covers for it. That way you don't have to just, to your point, dispose of the whole thing, but you could change the shape. There's lots of things. There's decades of development coming from LoveSack just on this platform. But, my, but I really want to touch on was um, your comment, Jay. I appreciate, uh, is it Jay or Jay? Jay. Yeah. I, um, Jay. Yeah. I, um, the thing is, is I don't disagree. We got lucky, okay? And I don't claim any genius in it. We, you, I told you my story. I made a big beanbag. People liked it. We kept going. But like, um, and we're in a category where it really works. I think that durable goods, refrigerator, take your pick, are going to be easier to leverage this design approach because you have the ticket values. You have a high price in general that you can exploit. And you have, um, you know, it just seems to be more natural. But I do, I will not accept, I just can't as an entrepreneur accept the idea of like can't or like impossible right it just i feel like i'm not a fashion guy right listen i think people that are incredibly adept at that will find a way they just need the framework okay here's the framework go step by step find a way to make this t-shirt maintainable upgradable right uh all these lovable all these things and then at the end of the day it's the consumer's choice but if more and more people start thinking this way then the demand comes there's also a trade-offs, you know, per, perhaps we buy stuff too cheaply. How about that? I mean, the whole country. By the way, poverty in America, I don't mean to get controversial, but poverty in America looks a lot different than poverty uh, in other places. Poverty in America often is still a huge flat screen TV, you know, um, poor diet, you know, but it's still Cheetos and, and, on the driveway. and Mountain Dew. And, and I'm not trying to be insensitive my point is just simply maybe stuff just got too cheap through this whole process from the 1930s on maybe people should just pay more for stuff and stuff should come at a higher standard on Last principle level. yeah maybe we don't need so many variations maybe we can still have a great economy by the way people then will criticize if you're right sean then the whole couch pie shrinks and right. any any entrepreneur that attacks a category through design for life lens will shrink that category because of their, ch that's my point. I'm all for it. Shrink my category. I hope the couch can, I'll go attack another one and my company will get plenty big. And then you'll say, well, that's bad for the economy. And what about capitalism? And what about the, you know, I say, let the money move to travel. I don't know. Let people take another vacation. The, the money will find its way back into the economy in other ways that may be more useful than another couch another collar, short, tighter pants, whatever it may be, you know, maybe there's just too much variation and, and people could learn to love objects that are simpler and, and less transient. And it'll come over decades and generations if I have my way or That's I'm quite, just a crazy person. Yeah, I think that those trends are already in place, Sean, in the millennials market. They're definitely not concerned about having the latest car. They don't even want a car, you know. And, yep. and definitely not interested in fashion. They're more interested in experiences and travel and, and using their limited time to enjoy thing, uh, enjoy experiences, not things. So I'm, I, and I like to think that I've always been that way. You know, I travel as much as I can and I love the way your world is sort of taking you off the beaten track as well because you've seen, like you said, poverty in America looks very different to to other places and that's that's another topic but um what was i going to say um gavin you were you were going to jump in there yeah yeah so i was going to say so this is this is an extreme example but there um so we i'm in a house up in maine um and um my wife's been talking about redoing the kitchen and there's this old coal stove and it's and it's just been sort of this fixture in the kitchen. It's taking up space. Gets used as a you know platform to put stuff. 
and we were talking about rewiring the house in a few weeks. And, uh, and I said, you know, it, instead of doing like, you know, a new stove, putting a stove over there, I could take the top off of this thing and I could turn it into an induction stove. You know, just buy an induction stove top, slot it into this thing. And now it's like this really cool retro coal stove with induction heaters in it, you know, and, and you know, throw cast iron skillets on it and, you know, that kind of thing. So that's just sort of a, you know, extreme example of just having fun with the really old stuff and, and converting it. But, you know, you could do the same thing with any old electric stove if you could, you could just change the top out, you know, so it's a regular, you know, burner that gets hot and then, you know, somebody has a um, infrared heater one or, you know, glass top, take and then eventually change that out and put an induction heater in or something. But there's all, there's just those iterations you can go. And if you've got a nice stove, you know, it looks good and it's, and it's, you know, not flashy, you know, stylistic or whatever like that, then, you know, it's good forever. You can just That's change right. out the, the heating but system. It needs to be designed that way. And, you know, things that are quite old often were. There's a lot of thought that went into the industrial design, you know, like that vacuum, that stove. Yeah. They're beautiful objects, even just as a piece of like furniture. And, and the thing is today, you know, again, stuff is just, it's all about, you know, we got to deliver a whatever, a, a, ra a cooking range, for under three ninety nine for the end cap at Home Depot, and you're going to end up with a piece of garbage, and right. it'll it'll work better than you know than that that coal stove and from a convenience standpoint for a little while, yeah. but then then there's all of that material that's just garbage that goes with it out the door because it has no value, and that's that's again the tenant lovable designing something, at least to a degree where it can be loved. And that's yep. something, you know, so it's, so the thing about the design for life framework is not just, again, it's not crunchy. It's not just an environmentalist, you know, sustainable at all costs kind of thing. It's like, it takes into account fashion. It takes into account taste design and some of it's subjective. So it's like a push pull companies need to do their part and design really well and put forth things that are good and valuable. Forget the price. They are valuable. Okay. Consumers need to shift their way of thinking. Otherwise, they're going to demand too much variability. They're going to demand too much fashion. They're going to demand too much change. They're going to demand too, stuff too cheap. Yep. And, and we'll never have a sustainable situation. Right. That's how I view it. Yeah. There's another thing so you that need to I just change taste. But yeah, go ahead. Change not only taste. Yeah. So this is Greg. Um, you not only need to change taste, but I wonder whether there, you've given some thought. I haven't looked at your website to financing. So many people buy cheap because that's what they can afford right now. You know, there was a time in which few people owned houses because, you know, you have to save up a lot in order to buy one. But we came up with financing arrangements that let people make the investment in things that are going to last for a longer period of time. So how does that fit into, I don't know, either in your company or in your vision? That's a great, that's a great point. You know, I think, um, I think that comes part and parcel with the evolution of the world. Luckily, we are in a place in the in our economy where that's very prevalent in our in our company. Yeah, I mean, almost forty percent of our transactions occur through what we call the LoveSat credit card, which is uh, um, third party backed. You know, you can apply for it and 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 then pay no interest sometimes over the course of many years, depending on what promotion we might be offering. Because we we just want people on the platform. And look, I wit it's a great point. We I witness, and this is this is the evidence that I believe this has legs. So I'll spend a lot of time in our showrooms personally, you know, trying to just be there, work with our people, get to know them, whatever, see what's happening on the front lines, I call it. And I will go in there on any given Saturday when, you know, uh, couples coming in to kick the tire, sit on the thing they've, they've researched online, come on, but it can't be comfortable. It must be boxy. There's no way it's that easy, blah, blah, blah. And they want to pick their covers or whatever it may be. And I see people, you know, convincing themselves, talking themselves into spending way more on sectionals. Like, you know, it's like maybe $4,000 for what they want from us versus $9.99 at Bob's. I mean, for like something that would fill the same space. And clearly ours is way different. I mean, that's a big leap. Yep. And I see them choose ours. Yep. And they may break out two credit cards to do it. They may apply for our credit to do it. But in my mind, see, that's where all you need to do is purvey things of value 
and present right. them in a way that people can understand them and see the value and then let people make the decisions on themselves. That's a beautiful thing about capitalism. It's a free country. People can do what they want right. and people will vote with their wallet. And I've seen it happen so many times now, personally, there's people that should not afford sacraments that choose to. And by the way, I will gladly push them right into it because I know from yeah. my own experience that they're, they're putting their hard earned money or money they haven't even earned yet into something that will actually be with them. Like I, I tell them and they're standing at the cash wrap, like you won't even appreciate sectionals till you've lived with him for like three years and your kids come along and knock that over and it's all over the, you know, that happens to us on like a weekly basis and we just peel the cover off and throw it in the washing machine. It's no big deal. Kid didn't need to be yelled at. There's peace in the home. We call that total comfort and it comes from a couch right? Reduces a little stress in your home, whatever it may be. And, 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 or you move and the thing would have been landfill or, you know, giveaway otherwise. And, yeah. and until you experience that, you can't appreciate the value that we've packed into this platform and pushed on you through our marketing. Unfortunately, there's a lot of other people pushing value less things through marketing and convincing people that they need them. Yeah. It's, it's to Greg's, Greg's point, too, you know, another example along those same lines is, is um, we just put an aluminum roof on our, on our house. So, and it is twice the cost of an asphalt roof. So, mm -hmm. but this, it'll last a hundred years. Yeah. You know, the asphalt roof's only going to last like 15 years. And, you know, when you, I guess, you know, when you're 20, 15 years sounds like a really long time. Right. But when you're 60, it's like 15 years is like, I'm going to have to do that again. And maybe another time after that, I don't want to do that. Like, you know, so, so it makes, and, you know, but it's those younger people, if they're going to, you know, especially if they're going to, if there's any chance of them staying in that place or like the furniture is great because you can just take it with you and go to wherever you're going next. But that's the long-term investment that you're going to, you know, that you're making that you're going to keep for a long time. And it's definitely paying for itself over the long haul. Just right. one of those, one of those things of you got to, you got to do it sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Um, I also wonder how your the design principles work out. So there, you know, couches are things that once they're manufactured, I mean, that's the major footprint. That's the major effect on the environment is the resources, et cetera. But to operate it, you know, <laughs> there's nothing to yeah. do that. Um, um, but other things like, let's say your stove or your refrigerator or your coffee maker, um, you know, a lot of the impact comes from operation and that's where you have issues around technology that might actually be more efficient. And if we listen to the people at the Rocky Mountain Institute, you know, you want things to fit together as a system um, in order to get those advantages, which can wash out the, you know, resource footprint in the product. So, you know, have you given some thought to that in your principles and in kind of delineating what kind of products, what kinds of industries um, are, you know, it, it, it fits more directly. Yeah, I mean, I think earlier we, we touched on the idea that there's no doubt that I think um, durable goods are a natural fit for this ethos. And, and listen, I'm, I'm questioning every day as we sort of write the book on this topic and delve deep into the research and delve deep into tangential, you know, uh, case studies and research to support what we're doing ourselves you know, how, how far does this, how realistic is this um, ethos, the design for life philosophy? And, and can it be applied across every many, some categories? And the answer is, I don't have all the answers yet. I think that I'm a, I'm a person on the planet that's read plenty of books and, you know, fancies himself uh, somewhat read up on these subjects. But Man, it's, an, it's a fast evolving world. I think there's a, people a lot smarter than me that are experts in their category. And that's, that's where I just like, I just view it as a challenge, you know? So someone who is, you know, we talked about cars earlier, very complex situation. I mean, you know, it's still debatable whether electric cars are even net good for the environment based on all the chemicals that have to go into that and then end of life and all these other things still at this moment anyway, right? With where electrical generation is anyway in america and, and everywhere and, right. and my cars point, may be the problem that doesn't it doesn't matter how they are fueled but it might be some people would argue that it's car is the sure. individual source of mobility but yeah anyway go ahead well no i mean but but my point being 
I think that if these captains of industry who, who care about what they're doing, like I care about furniture, as dumb as that sounds, um, dig in and they just set up, like, again, if I gave, if, if Elon Musk would listen to me and, and just take these eight, this eight point framework and say, hey, take your chassis, just try it. Show me what a design for life car looks like. I bet you the dude would, would, would get there. And I bet you it would challenge some of even his notions about what a Tesla is and, and the, even, even down to the power sources and, and different things, you know, that might, gen and, and look, I'm not going to criticize the guy. I mean, you know, he's, a, he's doing great. But there are people like that in this world that, that know more than I do, that I just believe what they need is they need the challenge. Like he didn't enter that process with this philosophy. Therefore, the Tesla is what it is. And there's lots of great things about it. And the company's, you know, rocket ship, no pun intended, but like, you know, maybe it could have even been more and maybe it still could be, or by the way, maybe a competitor could arise. And that's the beauty of it. Like, like I believe design for life is the ultimate competitive recipe. Like you want to take these guys down, go do it through my ethos. I bet it'll work. And so I could be I have yeah. a, a question based on that. So I'm looking at your site. Um, I'm looking at your messaging and I'm wondering why then you're not leading with your eight tenants and leading with the sustainability and leading with all of these things that we think the millennials are interested in, yeah. which is forever. You're leading with couches and sectionals and get free swatches. So you look like, and this, you know, don't take offense. I'm just a marketer. You look like, Every other couch uh, Bob's or you look like every other couch store. Yep. And yeah, you got to dig, you got to dig a couple layers in to really get there with us. Right. And the answer to your question is because we've tested it all. Well, that's and, what I wondered. Have you tested it? But, but so my, my comment to that might be if you led with more designed for life. And I know that that's a tab here. I'd have to dig. And I don't know what the hell that means. Cause I'm here to buy a couch. So designed okay. for life. I'm not even going to look at that, that well, part of the nav, but my question is, if you were to start to lead with some of those eight tenants, would it start to educate consumers, buyers, and these are entrepreneurs, these are business owners, these are executives, these are smart people about the whole consumerism movement um, or anti-consumerism movement? I mean, should that be part of your messaging? And Great. if you tested it and you, it's, they say, no, we just want to learn about couches, then cool. No, it's not that. It's, it's so, first of all, awesome point. And I think it's a really important point to discuss because, yes, I could go against what works and lead with that and have less effective marketing. And perhaps, you know, people that came in through the funnel might leave a little more educated. But I'll offer you this. Number one, this is, we know that this is a considered purchase. So by the time you're done considering it at all, we, we will have exposed you to the way we think and, and the benefits that come from, you know, the design for life approach to things. Um, so we'll get you that way. Number two, remember how I think about what I'm trying to achieve here. Like, like the way that, the way that this becomes bigger than just, you know, Sean's little couch experiment that some people that less than 1% so far of people purchase, by the way, we're the fastest growing furniture retailer in the United States. We have been for a few years and we're still less than 1% of market share. So if I want this to be really big itself and also inspire other entrepreneurs to follow suit and, and inspire therefore ergo, you know, millions of consumers to think differently. I got to put a lot of couches in homes because that's what's going to make you think differently. Like I said, you won't even appreciate your sectionals until you've lived with them a little while. Like you'll hear this crap and everyone's talking green and everyone's being environmental, but you won't really appreciate it until you've experienced it. And then you start thinking, and then this starts to bug you. I mean, it starts to bother you. And then you start looking around and you're like, there's nothing else out there. And, but when it comes from some other entrepreneur, maybe inspired by us, not because we preached it, but because we won because the scoreboard says you can't ignore us. We are so dang successful that you have to pay attention. Right. Now, they're, now even the hardcore capitalists are copying us because, and they may not be environmentalists at all, but all of a sudden they've, they've chosen to be more sustainable because it works. And now we've really started the flywheel in motion, right? And so 
I'm pretty cynical about marketing because for me, it's a means to an end. It's not the end. And if we treat it at the end, what we'll have is a somewhat successful, cute couch company that educated people, a few people. That's how I view it. Right. You know, I mean, I, I, I can understand Jay's point saying like, maybe you have a mission statement there, but to me, it would make more sense to send those points home with them. Yeah. You know, we, when you sit in a couch, usually you get like a warranty. It's like our promise and it's written down because they're going to look at that. And that, it would seem to me, that I would, I don't know if you do that now, but to me, that seems to be the place where you would do that. That's exactly right. And, and, and so listen, we're not hiding it. And I don't mean to make it sound like that. What we need to be is successful and, and by the way, uh, successful commercially and of course successful at, um, at educating you along the way. But we view that as a handhold, not as a, you know, beat you over the head with a, with a sustainable bat. Listen, um, we just got the top of the hour, so I would like to just tap the brakes. And um, I just wanted to thank Sean for being so generous with your time. I know um, this caught you at the last minute as well. But I also wanted to thank you, Sean, for setting us up with TerraCycle, because I saw a great video that you did with the, um, the yeah. guy whose name escapes me now from TerraCycle. And that um, they will be guests at a future town hall of ours in a few weeks' time. So thanks for making that sort of um, unplanned introduction because- yeah, They're amazing. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's gonna be a bigger conversation about landfill and avoiding it on a global scale. So I appreciate your partnership with them and your contribution to just making us think bigger and better about being conscious consumers. And I, I just love the idea of the um, design for life and we'll do everything we can yeah. to support and promote it. Um, we do have a conference coming up, which is kind of still under wraps, but it's around climate action and business solutions to it. And hopefully um, you can be a guest and, uh, at that event and, and, and help us um, and get onto that topic today. But I'm uh, from what I've heard, uh, you would be uh, predisposed to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> one, I have so one more everybody. question. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, Glenn, I just want to get this in. So what is your, your organizational purpose? You said that, you know, you've got your mission, you've got your tenants, you've got all this other stuff, but what is, yeah. is the purpose? So my whole approach to our, what I call our strategic guide revolves around answering the 12 W's, which is actually something I created because I didn't feel like any of the frameworks out there were complete enough. And what, what we would call our purpose, why we exist, is actually to bring total comfort to millions of homes. So the outcome of what I described, products that have all of these attributes, the end result is they bring total, like I described, you know, like, my kid knocks over the drink on the couch. It doesn't have to end up in a upset moment. That's, that's total comfort, which is a kind of an obvious thing for a, a sofa company to say, but we mean something much deeper than just like comfortable couches. That's a given. And, and we, we, the phrase that I, that I highlighted, uh, inspire mankind to buy less stuff, but buy better stuff is what we call our uh, big, hairy, audacious goal. You're right. You need that to our mission statement. And so, um, you know, we just characterize those things a little bit differently than you might imagine. Either one we could probably throw out there as our purpose, but that's how we, we're very religious about that terminology in general and, 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 and living up to uh, both of those edicts. Do you have a, an organization or something that you contribute to, buy a couch, give a couch, and that's just I'm throwing that out there and it's certainly not what it is, we, but. We don't do the one for one thing. Um, our big thing is, you know, design for life and, and what we describe. But as we evolve, you know, we, we flirted with different ways to get people's attention and also build more value into the whole experience. And those types of, those types of things are swirling. Cause look, just dealing with the, by the way, this couch, I just put in place of like a zombie couch that was here, right? A, a living dead couch that needed to go. And now I'm tasked with, like every American has been at some point in their life, what do I do with the carcass, right? right? All that wood, all that fabric, and it's sad. And so like, I think that's a big opportunity for us and something that that's we're actually huge. investigating seriously. Yeah, good, yep. okay. Yeah, it's just that's sort of where I'm transitioning my marketing branding career. So I was just asking yeah. selfishly to know what part of your journey you're on in that 
that purpose piece, like where are you going with that? So very, it's been a long baked thing for us. And listen, it's not just words on the wall. Like everyone, I mean, we eat, sleep and breathe the purpose, the mission, the values, all of these things. And we, we, that's a whole other topic, but I'm very passionate about it. I appreciate the question. Appreciate your guys' time. Thanks for bothering. Great to meet you all. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you, you. Glenn. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you. Bye.